So this is number two of the talking shops, um, Brexitorama. Um, it's a very unfortunate thing that we thought it was important to discuss in the context of the International Festival is that, as we know, um, at the, um, the end of June uh, 2016, this country voted uh, by 52% to 48% to um, uh, leave the European Union. And um, that process is still happening. Um, people question the process as it's happening, but it's still happening and there is obviously the expectation uh, that um, by this time next year uh, we won't this country won't be fully part of the European Union um, we as an international festival um, one of the themes we've wanted to sort of play on in, in this festival is that is actually internationalism and you know we have made sure that in this festival um, we have an even higher European and world program uh, than than we've presented um, in in other years. Um, that's not because we're not going to do it after Brexit. It's just that we wanted to, uh, in some ways, through that sort of say how for us the sort of the international collaboration, the international presentation, the meeting of our Milton Keynes audiences and international artists is is really vital to what we do as an international festival. So we've got gathered today here three people, two people that run um, extraordinary international companies and also the artistic director and leader of another extraordinary international company. Um, and I'm first of all just going to ask them to introduce themselves uh, and a little bit about their company, but also how their company operates in the European and, and the sort of international art sector. So, Alison. Well, thank you. Um, I, can, I can try. Uh, my name is Alison, Alison Woods, and I'm the executive director of a company called No Fit State Circus. Uh, we are a Welsh company, and we are proud to be Welsh. And our strap line is, we bring the world to Wales and take Wales to the world. Uh, we are an international touring company, and that means that not only do we tour throughout the world, but we also bring artists in to work with us from throughout the world. Right at this moment, uh, one, one production is here at the festival. Yay! Yay! <laughs> They're just arriving backstage. They're just arriving now. If you run and leave now... <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> Show, shows on Wednesday and Thursday. <laughs> uh, and, and we've also got a production down in Avignon. And for us, this is normal that we tour two productions a year and they will typically be in two different countries. Uh, predominantly in Europe, but not exclusively. And our performing company are predominantly from Europe, but not exclusively. So that's who we are and what we do. My name is Dries Verhoeven. Um, I'm an artist from Amsterdam. Uh, I made Phobia Rama, the piece that takes place in the black tent over there. Um, I'm proud to be European, I'm proud to be Dutch. Um, we tour a lot internationally, predominantly Europe, but also this year um, we showed a bit outside of Europe. Um, so just to say that when Brexit takes place, we're still very happy to come to the UK. Um, yeah, what to say? Um, it's I, I show my work also at international festivals in Holland, but it's becoming more and more complicated actually to show the work in Holland because everything that is international sounds more cool, uh, which makes it easier actually for us to tour, for example, in Germany and in Switzerland and Austria, than sometimes to show at Dutch festivals. Um, which is not a bad thing, I would say. Um, and that's what we've been doing for about 12 years now. Uh, my name is Rachel Feuchtwang and um, I'm here with the company Schweigman N, or Schweigman and I should say, who are also a Dutch company based in Utrecht. Um, I myself come from London, um, but I've been for the last 20 years in the Netherlands, so I'm truly a European with a dual nationality and very proud. Um, uh, our company is only for the last, I'd say, four to five years been most active on the international scene. We perform a lot outside of Europe, 
um, in the Middle East especially, um, which has its uh, complications in terms of the logistics. Um, and um, and will be c continuing to perform a great deal outside of Europe in the future. Which isn't to say that Europe isn't a focus for us, it's, it's more to do with the work that we make tends to have a particular catchment for, funnily enough, a British audience, um, but not a German audience. Um, I'm not quite sure where that is yet, but we're exploring that. In terms of the logistics of touring after Brexit, I have huge concerns because it's already complicated enough working with an international company. I mean, our company is not entirely Dutch, so there are lots of non-Dutch Dutch nationals working with us. We will increasingly experience more and more complications about how to, how to do that. Also, because our work is technically quite complicated, it becomes more and more difficult logistically to be able to bring our sets to the UK, I imagine, in the future, which will be a great shame. Yeah, I mean, maybe let's just start with that, you know, the sort of, in a way, the, 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 the nuts and bolts of, of, of what it might mean. Uh, and then maybe we'll move back to perhaps some more of the philo philosophical or, or societal ele ele elements of, of it happening. I mean, is it something, Alison, say, that you're already having to, well, you're always having to think about it, but, you know, my understanding at the moment is that there's a whole set of technical papers that are going to be published over the next two months, and I would imagine one of those might cover... Um, the impact on cultural touring in and out, but I don't. I don't know. What What, what do you know about about? I know nothing. <laughs> <laughs> we all know nothing. That's part of the problem. I think. It is. I. I think that. I think that Brexit is going to be challenging and difficult in ways we cannot yet imagine, and uh, confronted with a government that is so woefully unprepared that clearly has not thought through these issues in any detail, or indeed at all, either prior to or to much uh, since the referendum, I'm deeply concerned. You talked about the practicalities of it. Um, the, the value of the single market for all of us working in the cultural sector is both quantifiable and tangible. Um, about a year ago, we took a show to New York for a month. And I worked out that taking a show to New York cost us almost exactly £46,000 more than it would have cost us to take the same show to anywhere in the EU for the same period of time. And that additional cost was generated entirely by additional bureaucracy, admin, certification, licensing, insurance, etc., and my great fear, it, Brexit is not going to prevent us from working internationally or prevent companies from other countries coming here. But it may so very substantially increase the cost of that that it makes it prohibitively expensive. My great fear is that the people of Milton Keynes, the people of every community throughout the UK will become culturally impoverished because they do, will not have access to work to the same extent in potentially a year's time. And in reality, we are actively turning down all EU bookings for the first period, um, April to June next year, because, because we just don't know what's going to happen. You can't predict, we what, can't what, predict what's going to happen. What's going to happen at all. Are there any other reflections from? Uh, I don't know uh, much more than you do. Uh, I would hope that, that um, UK stays at least in the internal market but still like to show your work in Norway for example or in Switzerland is already way more uh, complicated than to show in one of the other countries uh, we have lots of p paperwork when we when we showed the works in in Oslo um, so that's at least gonna happen yeah which is a pity because we love the, the British audience so we we hope to continue showing the work here but I think there's also a kind of I mean it's it's practical and uh, philosophical at the same time there's there's we, we took a piece of work at the beginning of 2016 to Iran, um, which was a Dutch company taking it to uh, the country with two British nationals in the company. The two of us had much more problems with getting a visa um, and with getting access to the country at all, simply because we're British, um, yet we're Dutch residents live working with a Dutch company. So there's a sort of cultural resistance to um, the anti 
uh, and the, the anti-foreign and discriminative um, actions of the British government in the last uh, in recent years, which is having a huge effect on the cultural diplomacy work that other organisations do are doing, and that has a very negligible effect on on how companies like ours and others continue to want to be want to be doing culturally diplomatic work and taking work which has huge capacity for for um, making friends across the world. Um, that's going to be more and more difficult. Yeah, just on that, you know, there's uh, it's connected, um, which is obviously in terms of borders, but I think people who know the programme might know that um, one of our highlights of the programme uh, that runs Friday, Saturday, Sunday at the end of uh, this week is Halka by Group Acrobat Tangier from, from Morocco. Um, and because they're from Morocco, um, they, we have to sponsor them, we have to be a sponsor um, through the visa system and they have to apply for visas which cost a huge amount of money um, and also we have, you know, we there's lots of challenges in terms of the absolute bureaucracy, the amount of time it's taken us, the amount of time it's taken the company to just get, you know, 15 people uh they're actually based, most of them at the moment, in France, just from France to here. It's huge, you know, and I would hope that, you know, it just seems that that, that is another element in terms of sort of island Britain that, um, you know, is something that we're having to just work with. And, you know, we have to make the decision if we, you know, if we're going to spend £5,000 on visas for a set of artists, then... We do, but you know it's obviously a really significant uh, decision to 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 sort of make make those decisions. I I, I would like to you know it's an, hopefully a, a, an interesting subject, and I would like to open up um, if there are any particular views or people would like to ask anyone on the panel any more of it. We we've got um, I think we've got a mic here, so. It, it, just at the moment, is there anybody who would like to chip in or, or, or say something before we carry on? So if you just talk into the mic, because we're, we're filming this and then people will hear your question. Just um, on cross-border uh, work and travel, for cultural, t cultural purposes, um, you probably already know, but there's like a uh, US star has extended itself um, to Holland, I think even possibly through Italy. So there'll be, there'll be questions of uh, the uh, bureaucracy and the, how that will sort itself out post-Brexit. There's obviously a sense that that will happen, but there's also, you know, the practicalities of, of you know, of, of freight and, and coming in <laughs> with trucks and, you know, that... that um, that there's a whole different level, as Dries was saying, in terms of them touring into, say, another country in Euro in in mainland Europe, like Switzerland, but that's outside of the EU. Then you know the level the level of, of work that you as an organisation have to undertake is is significantly different. I mean, just to add, the train is fantastic. It goes now directly to Amsterdam, but you still have to get off and show your passport because it's not a Schengen country. But the other way around, it's it's easier, right? From from the UK to Amsterdam, it's one hour uh, faster than the other way around. So we are less, we have less fear for the British than the other way around, yeah. <laughs> which is like says something. It does. But uh, a couple of years ago, we uh, went uh, into mainland Europe for a tour at precisely the moment when there was a strike on the the French ferries. That's and pretty much all year round, isn't it? <laughs> we hit the peak of ferry strikeness. And our trucks were stuck in the stack for about two and a half days. Um, and we managed to get to, I can't remember where we were going to at that particular moment, Amsterdam maybe, but I'm not sure. Uh, we had to forego all days off in order to catch up the time because they'd, all the trucks had been stuck in the, in the, in the, in the, in the queue. Um, so you can get through, but, and, and we will still get through. It have to be like a listen on the wire. <laughs> listen on the wire that, um yeah, but just uh, keep your eye out on the local news and yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we will well, still get through. Yeah, People will still come in here. The world is not going to stop completely. <laughs> well, but I think that the challenge is very the practical challenges, uh, let alone the cultural and philosophical challenges that you just started to mention, are going to be very, very significant. Right. Yeah. Okay. 
Thank you. And I just wondered in terms of, you know, the cultural, philosophical, whether just say within your company, you know, within your companies, you know, which, as you say, are made up of people of all nationalities, it, how, how that's sitting and, and is that actually sitting in terms of people worrying about their work with the company or is it actually affecting how people might think about making work or um, is it making you think about where you're based? Uh, yes, all of those things. Yeah. Um, it's not good when you go to work and find colleagues literally in tears. Um, we have a, a, a we run a youth circus. Our head of youth circus is Polish. The day after the referendum, I go into the office and she is literally sitting there in tears, saying, "Am I still welcome in this country? Can I still stay here? Are you going to throw me out?" Um, I have a French colleague, Camille Beaumier, that some of you may know, who is extraordinary. She is our international promoter and producer. Um, she's leaving. She doesn't want to live in this country anymore. Um, she She's going back to France. Um, and Brexit is not the only reason, but it's, a, it's mm. a significant part of the reason. Why would you want to stay in a country where 48% of the population, or more precisely 37% of the population, have told you that you are not welcome? And for those of us who work in the cultural sector, who work in the arts, we may not be aware of the the real racism and xenophobia that e EU nationals are facing on a day-to-day -day basis now. Um, this, is, this is anecdotal, but I want to say it because it is important. My daughter is a nurse. She is British. But her father was Bosnian, and so she has a Bosnian surname. On a regular basis, she is told by patients, what are you still doing in my country? We voted to get people like you out. When are you going home? Now, if you are an EU national, or indeed from anywhere in the world, and you've come to this country, and that is the attitude that you are now facing, when you are working in the NHS, what does that say about us as a people, as a country, as a community, as a culture? that that is the message we're sending out to the rest of the world. And we here are the privileged few, I would say. But we need to recognise the reality of the, the asinine stupidity and horror that lies behind many of the, the, the Leave votes. Not all, but, but a significant proportion. And that's exactly that could be a reason to stay, right? Absolutely. Because it's up to us, the artists, to show that it's important to meet each other Absolutely. and to meet the people we, we don't recognize as um, ourselves, to meet the deviant, to meet the people that come from other countries that are portrayed in a, um, in a negative way by the media. It's up to us to make a difference. Absolutely. So exactly that could also challenge us. Exactly that could give us more power. Which Absolutely. of course goes into the territory, part of the territory yeah. that you're, you're exploring sure. with, um, yeah. with Fabio Rama. Yeah, we made a show on politics of fear, and and clearly, uh, I mean, Brexit was, well, <laughs> was based partly at least on politics of fear in terms of trying to convince people not by f with facts but with warnings, right? Simply because when I warn you for something to happen, you're more likely to hear than when I share a thought with you, and that's what Brexit did show. There were so many people, well, you know better than I do, but I hear the story that so many British people checked online what the EU was after the Brexit vote, right? Um, yeah, and I think these, well, we all know that many of the people who voted for leave had problems. They, ha they wanted to say something, right? It's just that this answer was not the answer to the question. Um, it's not that the refugees are a problem to, or are an answer to economic problems. Um, yeah, and, and it is clearly about politics of fear, and it is also about the fear for the other, the fear for the people we don't recognize, we, um, yeah, that are portrayed um, as the, 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 the perpetrators, the, the usual suspects. Um, and while showing this work, we realize also that it's an important thing to keep on showing. So, um, yeah, lots of my works are doing that, are bringing... Uh, 
Western white audience in contact with people who don't look like them. Um, and it gives us lots of strength also to do so. When we brought the piece to Athens, um, we had problems to cross the border, although all of the guys had a Dutch passport. Uh, they were all kept at the airport in Amsterdam, which is a very... Well, I never have problems in Amsterdam leaving uh, the Dutch um, airport, but they had simply because of the way they look. And it's not that we get, got frustrated, it's not that we got angry, we got extra energy. We were like, hey, this is something we need to tackle, right? How, how could it happen that the man who is checking our passports is seeing us now as the possible perpetrators? I think um, it's important to also add that, that you as a Dutch artist and, and myself as well are not um, immune to the kind of, um, as you called it, asinine, rabid um, xenophobia that exists in the UK. It is actually something which is broader than just the UK. I, you know, Brexit has been one of the most explicit manifestations of that. Um, but you can, there are similarly uh, uh, unpleasant and and un, and very un, uh, disenabling activities going on in the, in the Netherlands, in France, in Belgium. You know, we are not alone here. And not that that's particularly comforting. So, um, on the uh, representation and the currents, uh, there is like a Green Party mayor in Amsterdam. Well, I just so there's still some sort of lib progressive liberal elements. I think there are progressive liberal elements everywhere. And the challenge, and I count myself as one of them, as part of that uh, section of society, if you like. And I think I completely agree with you. We should view Brexit. We should view the rise of the far right right across Europe and most worryingly in places like Poland and Hungary as a collective challenge. And Brexit is also evidence, I would suggest, of our collective failure to stand together, to, to unite together and to recognise those threats, those dangers in time. Yeah. And it's still time now. Yeah. And we, we, I don't know, when we talk about the British, we always talk about resilient people, people who are able to cope with problems in a very, I don't know, in a very flexible way, in a very, um, you don't seem to panic too much, right? <laughs> but the last few years, I sometimes get the feeling that things are changing. Um, but I don't know. I hope that, that the British don't only um, trust on, on anger and on frustration, but that it, that I don't know, maybe the first half year and the first year, you still feel this pain and this anger and you still feel, shit, it could have been so much better. But I'm interested in what comes after. I'm interested in, could you find other ways to to talk to an audience maybe that did vote, leave, and not to be collectively with people who share our political opinions and to say, oh my God, it's so so bad what the neighbors did do, right? Because then you just confirm... But it's not, it's not the neighbors, it's our family. Or the neighbors of the neighbors. Or it's our families. Yeah. It's, it's, it's literally members of our own family who are now, and in, I'm thinking now personally, who are now being... But maybe it's also good racist. to ask if there's someone in the audience who voted Leave and who would like to share yeah. why and yeah, what yeah. he hopes the country will look like in three or four years. Is there anyone? Now that's a pity. That is really, that is really, really a pity. Um, I didn't vote Leave, I voted Remain, but I, I think we need to be careful I mean, I don't disagree with anything that you said. I think we need to be careful for two reasons. One is um, a lot of very sensible people voted leave for very um, good um, reasons that, that command respect on an intellectual level relating to for constitutional reasons, for um, reasons to do um, with what happens in Brussels, and et cetera, et cetera. So... I think we need to be careful about categorising the Leave vote as just a sort of racist lump of people. Uh, and I think the other reason we need to be careful is certainly, I mean, I'm from London, so maybe I'm lucky, but uh, I mean, almost everybody I meet in my life is, um, is actually um, very open to people of all um, uh, ethnic origins, sexual orientations, etc., etc. So I, I, where I would just urge some caution is 
is um, wherever I go around the country, actually, I think the vast majority of people um, are very open to, to people of all all backgrounds. I do think it's worrying, uh, you know, we all saw the story in the paper at the weekend about um, UKIP even, you know, making a, a comeback. I mean, I do think there is, there's a worrying um, fringe of people, um, but I'm probably just a naive person, but I hope it's a fringe and I hope it's not um, a really substantial part of our country. And that's not my personal experience day in, day out. Um. I, I, I completely agree with what you said, and I wouldn't, certainly wouldn't want to give the impression that everybody who voted Leave was a racist or uh, a xenophobic, uh, unthinking person. Um, I think part of the problem is that Brexit has allowed people who previously might not have been prepared to speak to speak. They have the, a, a sense of permission to say things which a couple of years ago people would, would not have felt permitted to say. And on one level that's good. It's, it's much better that people say openly what they really think. I also agree with you that, so we have very, very specifically performed over the last year very, very heavily in those places where there was the highest leave vote. And the welcome has, without exception, been warm and generous to a multiracial, multicultural, multinational company. On a personal level, we have, we have not faced anything that uh, akin to racism, and neither has anybody in the company. That is absolutely true. But I think that we are part of a privileged enclave. And I think the experience of other people in other sectors of the economy is not the same. I, I would agree just with another part of my work. Um, I produced a, a new show which was bringing together um, a puppet company from Germany and a drumming group from the UK. Um, this was my sort of personal simple response to, to, to Brexit. With, and it's a big street parade, you know, which thousands of people can watch and um, we called it Sense of Unity um, and we've toured it, last year we toured it to places like uh, Great Yarmouth and Bournemouth and Blackpool and actually again, you know, sort of specifically wanted to take it, take it to those places and of course had wonderful large audiences, people loving it and, 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 and loving, loving the work and, you know, within all the publicity, we made sure it was very clear what it was, you know, that it was this collaboration because we need, you know, we really want to obviously tell the, tell these very, you know, if it's a simple story like that. And I think that's, you know, that's one of the simple ways that I think we need to perhaps keep telling about our internationalism that, you know, no fit state is made up of, you know, people from 12 different countries or whatever, you know, um, you know, it, it is, it, it is one of the things that, uh, that, that, that we can do. I just wonder if in terms of actually making work or any other activities that you think that actually we in the cultural sector um, might engage in uh, that we're not already. Uh, is that anyone got any ideas about that or is that just that we carry on making the work that we're doing and you know are conscious of the frame having sh or shifting and because by that shift that we that we then are shifting as well and i'm yeah, also well, there's work i mean the, mm -hmm. yep that yeah w when you use the word privilege then we privilege and we find out that everybody in the in this tent at least um did vote for the same thing um you could ask yourself the question is there is there a possibility, right, to reach out to bigger audiences? And is there a way to tackle also these topics in the work we show and the work we make? Do we dare to disrupt? Do we dare to be political in the work? Do we dare to have a proper conversation with people about the uneasy things? Um, because I, I would like to talk with someone who has this feeling about Brussels who, and, and ask him, what is your experience? Is that, do you have, 
a real bad experience that makes you vote this or did you watch too much that TV program or did you open up the Daily Sun uh, a few times too often or you know where from where do we get our information and that's an important question I think and I yeah um, where in this world do we still get our uh, proper information right in the, the world of, of post-truth politics and, and fake news and can we still have talks with each other um, what does it mean that that 95% of our information we get from online media instead of meeting each other and that's why we have festivals like this that's why there uh, is something like the European uh, capital of culture which unfortunately won't take place in the UK um, and won't take place in Milton Keynes. Won't take place in Milton Keynes. It would have been a beautiful um, opportunity. But yeah, I'm, I'm always a big fan of work that makes me feel uneasy, that confronts me with, that doesn't confirm, that confronts me with the things I wasn't aware of, and that tries to activate me to take a stand about things I, I wasn't so sure about. Um, when we are sitting in the same tent and we just confirm how how bad our lives will be like in three, four years, that doesn't really bring us anywhere, I think. Let's let's bring in these couple of other comments. Is it? Hi guys, first of all, thank you very much for uh, being here. Um, just with the whole thing with kind of fake news and being a global village and what Drews was saying with um, kind of people's views and how you want to express yourself um, through your artistic work, how do you make sure you're not kind of overly influenced by what's going on with people's uh, kind of negativity on Brexit? How do you make sure that in your art you're not um, kind of, well, I can't really say wrongly influenced, but overly influenced to go against the modern view? So how can you make sure that your kind of artwork is still balanced, but you still want to get your kind of view across without kind of overly influencing people so obviously the main thing is that people can still make up their own minds whereas things like fake news on face facebook is kind of kind of wrongly influencing people hmm. um, um our work is not explicitly political full stop um block possibly which is which is being performed here is possibly the most political piece that we have created for many, many years, and it is the antithesis of didactic. The content is very open to interpretation, and I have heard radically different interpretations of what was going on in that show. Our response with our most recent work, uh, a show called Lexicon that we premiered a couple of years, uh, a couple of months ago, was to create a work that is unapologetically joyous, that is simply a celebration of the ridiculousness that human beings can get up to, that is so full of love and human warmth. Um, for me, that is the most political thing that you can do at the moment. Um, because it hopefully, maybe, just allows people to re-see the world in a different way, through a different lens. Um, whether it works, I have no idea. But that was our response. Um. Yeah, I don't. I don't think our work has changed at all in the last fifteen years. In many ways, I think we've continued to make the the woman who makes most of our work, Bauke Schweichmann, is very much occupied with the same things as she was fifteen years ago. Um, uh, however, I think that the audiences have changed, and audiences' interpretations have become much more explicit. Um, when we made a piece um, in two thousand and fifteen, that again was wordless, but was set in a forest with. 50 people coming very slowly out of the forest, everyone thought we were making it about the refugee crisis, simply because that happened in the summer that we were making the work. Um, so people will always, all of our work is around uh, um, social contact. 
is really focusing on what happens between human beings. How can we open ourselves up for a more uh, sensory perception of the world around us? Um, and that includes human contact as well as your environment. So how you interpret as an individual or as a group is entirely up to you. That's what we would like the work to be able to continue to do rather than um, express our own opinion of what that is. I think my work is maybe a little bit more political in terms of that the last five, six years I have been working with refugees. I have been working um, in a disaster zone in, in Sri Lanka, for example. I'm Right now I'm working with people who are clearly all um, from non-Western, non-white uh, backgrounds. Uh, they, the work is discussing how do we deal with the other, um, but I never hope to push my own opinion, simply for that reason, what I stated before, that I, as an audience member, never want to be confirmed in what I know already and what I think already and what is my taste already. I'm, I'm very allergic to a show that confirms my taste. Um, I always like to be disrupted in, in how I see, how I watch and how I, what I like. Um, and this piece is clearly confronting you with the way your fear receptors work. Because when you, when you are in your living room in um, London, Chelsea, and you are never in contact with um, a refugee, it's very easy to have an opinion on that, right? Um, I think it's very important to realize how we ourselves function, right? How our fear receptors in this case function. And what I hear, what I yesterday I had a talk with someone who said, I really have empathy now with people who voted um, leave because I found out about myself when fear is taking over from common sense. And I think that's, um, with many, many movements now in Europe, when you talk about new nationalism, um, that is the case, that people don't follow their thoughts, but they follow their, their biggest fears. And it's good, I think, to dive into that and to spend time and to think, but what are these fears actually and what are they based on? Um, and how does our body function? Um, clearly, when I, when I give, when you give everybody in, in the UK a question, uh, a questionnaire and you ask them, what do you think of racism? They will all say, oh, that's a very bad thing, right, racism. It's important to find out the racist tendencies inside yourself without being guilty, without knowing that that is a bad thing. First of all, to recognize it. First of all, to realize, hey, this is how I function. And the question is, do we still in this time, which is very polarized, dare to do that, right? Not to think in terms of the good and the bad. That's the evil, and we are the good guys. No, but try to find out where is the evil in ourselves, or where is the, the ambiguous in ourselves? Where is, yeah, what are the parts in ourselves that we're not proud of? And that's when a a work becomes political for me. Thanks, and ju just there's another couple of comments in the audience. Just wanted to to comment actually on on, on this question in that I I see in Dries's work and I see in the response to Dries's work from from the audiences that have come out and also the response on on Twitter and so on that that people have got a very individual response to your work so um, it's very difficult to say that you've affected them in fact what you've done is you've created a trigger that has um, either been a, an emotional response or a physical response and what's happened to them in their journey until that point makes them react very differently so uh, uh, I, and I know I've seen it I've, I've experienced it three times and interestingly the first time it, everything was in Dutch and the second time and the third time have been in English, and my response to it was slightly different from that perspective. But but there was still a, a, a physical kind of response which I couldn't control in terms of fear. And I think that trigger was actually not to do with the piece itself, but actually what happened to me some time ago. And, I, and I've seen that happen a lot with people's response. So actually it's not just about the immediacy of the work that you're producing at this particular point in time, but actually reflecting and, and, and giving people the, the chance to then uh, think about what that's, how they've got to that point in terms of their own personal thinking 
about how they feel about the world, how they feel about other people. And I think that's a really interesting thing that artists do, is that they, they allow people to, to have that, that moment of reflection and pause to kind of think about themselves and their, and th their place in the world and how they can make a difference rather than just what the artist is trying to tell me to do. I think there's also something that happens in a live experience which can lead from an individual response to a collective responsibility. Um, and I think one of the issues that I have most um, trouble with around Brexit is the lack of thought that went into the vote, into the preparation and into the decision um, from the referendum. And I don't think that the 52% were aware of the implications that it would have had they been better informed, then it might have been a different decision. And similarly, I think in, in theatre in particular, but in all other forms of art to some extent as well, there is a kind of call for collective responsibility, um, which I uh, welcome, um, would like to see more of. I think it's important that we all as individuals uh, are becoming more aware of, of what uh, we are implicating others in. Thank you. Um, we're going to wrap up. Is there another, any more burning questions? There are comments. Yep. Okay. Yep. Let's. Uh, Bill, before you recently spoke about uh, the outlay financially and logistically you had on healthcare, do you think in a post-Brexit UK you could afford those same luxuries to more up-and-coming British acts, and whether that could be a positive impact on arts in the UK? So that that would encourage the insularity. Um, I think I think within that, you know, we're we're, we're looking for mixed programming. So you're, and in an, particularly in an international festival where you're trying to bring a really interesting, diverse mix uh, from the world um, to a place, and in a way to throw those ingredients of the um, of the cocktail together, and and see what that does, and what it does with the people of the place of Milton Keynes um, I would all I would I would always want to do that I was always want to do that and I think we need to you know we need to work really hard to um, maintain that and to maintain those resources and that's not at the expense of working with UK companies or emerging artists in any way it's just it is it is the nature of some some of these points which I think ha have you know that there's a a level of of alchemy sometimes that happens from the 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 international moments that happen within these festivals so that would that would be my answer to that and um, one final question uh yeah hi thank you very much uh for the panel and for the very interesting points um it's really interesting the uh the kind of the show of hands that you did at the beginning um that indicated that just about everybody in the tent voted remain. Um, speaking personally, that's really, really gratifying because I, I'm one of the leaders of a local group in Milton Keynes who uh, we can continue to campaign to s both stop Brexit um, and uh, we're currently campaigning uh, for the uh, a people's vote on the final Brexit deal. So if anybody wants to uh, join us, do please come and see me afterwards. Or if you want to sign the petition for the people's vote, do come and uh, join me afterwards. Um, the question that um, I want to ask you, though, is that, um, I mean, I guess one would one would have guessed that the vast majority of people who work in culture and the arts and the vast majority of people like us who are interested in culture and the arts and so come to festivals like this, that we probably would have voted Remain. Um, and, and I also, you know, it's interesting the question down at the front here about the influences on your work as artists um, and that some of you to lesser and greater and lesser d d extents are uh, political in your work. I wonder what you think might work, artistic work might look like that was coming from the leave perspective or was coming from the perspective of these, what all of us seem to agree are quite dangerous uh, nationalist populist movements around Europe. What, what would those artists be producing? What would their work look like and how would it be different to yours? 
That's a brilliant question. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> that is an absolutely brilliant question. You're right, the cultural sector uh, voted Remain higher than any other sector in society in, in, in Britain. 96%, 94%, I mean, it was enormous. So it's unlikely that we're going to see a piece of work created by somebody who voted Leave. I mean, it's got to be possible. Sorry? The vote li the, uh, to leave, to, to still be a part of the EU, yeah, it's, I guess sort of left to left centre, uh, remain in the European Union. And there's only a few exceptions with like, to, I think Tony Benn in his time was for leaving the e EU and there's a small number of Greens as well, but it's mainly like left left to centre on who are staying Brexit. So. I'm going to yes. keep us on the cultural question, that very interesting, you know, talking about framing. Yes. And if you yes. could imagine the frame I don't, I don't know. I think if anyone who's seen For the Time Being, the show that we're here, we have here, it could easily have been made by a Leave voter. Um, it, 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 it's, it's dealing with fear, discomfort, anxiety and joy all at the same time. Mm. I don't think it, you know, it's highly political without having any po political message in it. Mm. Um, simply because it's about people and about the interaction between people. So I, I don't necessarily think that a Leave voter would make a different piece of work. I'm not sure I, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I hoped for. No, I mean, the, that's, I mean, artists, people working in the cultural field are sometimes not so much afraid for what they don't know yet, right? We have the privilege to be adventurous. We have the privilege to to look for what is not made before. And I think many of the people who, who um, voted, for example, for Brexit, wanted to go back to what they know, to a state 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago. And I don't know many artists that think like that. Also, Bauke is really not like that. She is always confronting us with our ability to dream and our ability to go on hunting and to find something in ourselves, to find the children in ourselves and to not polarize and to think beyond reason. And But there's also the kind of work that we can bring in the cities that is addressing everybody. When Christo is wrapping up a building, everybody is invited to have a look there. And when you do that, you might find some pleasure in yourself, you might find something in yourself that you were not aware of that might make you a little bit more gentle or a little bit more tender or a little bit more likely to open up a conversation with your neighbors, right? When when uh, Royal Deluxe is, is inviting these big giants in the city, it's bringing cities together and it's not forcing people to take a political stand. It's not didactic in terms of telling people what to vote, but it's bringing people together and they find each other and they're starting up a conversation and they find out what it feels like to talk with each other instead of about each other. And that's, I think, very important. I think there's a very s small project, well, a medium-sized project we're doing with company from Chile, Teatro Container, who have a theatrical performance that takes the form of a community feast. So we have two days of community feasting with the people of West Bletchley and it will be very interesting to see how that goes in terms of, you know, bringing people together for, you know, a concerted two hours of performance and eating together, sitting down together. You know, that's uh, one of the closing uh, moments we have in the festival on Saturday and Sunday of this week. Um, I am going to wrap up. I think you'll find that quite a lot of the population of West Bletchley did vote leave. So that will actually be a very interesting uh, experience. Yeah. 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 Maybe another piece I can uh, recall 100%. Um, it's a piece by Rimini Protocol, a German group that brings, uh, they try to have 100% representation of the city on stage. So there's 100% London and 100% Moscow and 100% Athens. And, and they really try to have like a clear representation of the city in terms of male, female, in terms of left-wing voters, right-wing voters, in terms of uh, gay, straight people, and so on. And 
I think is very important and I think it's surprising also to see people that are not like you but are also in the city and and I think one of the the main thing I said it before dangerous is that we are just confirming each other that that you tell me what you think is important and I can just not and then we try to f then we start to forget that there's people on the other side of the wall having another opinion and other desires and other wishes and yeah, a piece like that um, made me aware of that. Yeah. I am going to finish there. Um, thank you. Um, I felt that was quite a discussion. Um, and uh, I think that will be interesting viewing um, for the other people that will see it uh, in, in, in the coming months. So thank all you. Thank you, Dries. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Alison. And also thank you very much on a lovely hot afternoon to give up uh, 45 minutes of your time for this uh, important and necessary uh, discussion. So thank you.